Let's put our phones on silent. I need to check mine. Oh, there he is. Ready? You ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll do a roll call. Here. 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 All right, we'll open with fun stuff, recognitions. Oh, Who's reading to me? me. Yeah, surely I will, sorry. Uh, who wants about, about, uh, Mr. Jacobs, do you want to go and shake hands tonight? Sure. Hector? And get the certificate. Why don't we stand on the side of the table this way you're not in front of the board? There you go. Okay, I will do my best with the names this evening. There's a few on here that are long. As an Eagle Scout project, the following student created a presentation and spoke to the Riverside Township Board of Trustees. He requested and was awarded grant money to refurbish drums for the RB band since there is a need for more instruments due to growth in the percussion department. Congratulations, Liam Coombs. Liam, you want to tell us a little bit about your project, how this got started, and uh, sure. Uh, so I'm a <coughs> freshman at RB. Uh, I've been, or I'm in the uh, the marching band, uh, and I noticed that a lot of our percussionists didn't have enough instruments uh, to play. So we had a, a, t a bunch of kids just like clapping their hands uh, <laughs> instead of playing on the drums. Uh, so I, I found a a bunch of old beat up drums that I can refurbish. I've, uh, since I've refurbished drums before, uh, I feel like I have some good experience. Uh, so hopefully I can open up some opportunities for future students. Great. Um, your life? Yes. And uh, your, so this was your project. Mm -hmm. When, are you, you have partials open? How many more merit badges do you have? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I think no? around four. Okay, awesome. So you're really close. Yes. And you have the time in? You've mm -hmm. been lifelong enough? Yes. Oh, nice. So before Some of us aren't Boy Scouts, so I know. I'm sorry. She knows that. Life, life, life Scout. It goes. Uh, the last three are Star Life Eagle. So and you need like for Star, you need three months, six months. Uh, life, you need to be three months. Uh, six months? Six months? I think it goes four months, six months. Four six months, months, six months, and six months. And then, so then there's some time requirements in there, some badge requirements, some leadership requirements in there before you can get Eagle, right? Mm -hmm. So 24, are you in 24? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Liam, and congratulations. Okay, Liam, we can, we can have a seat. We'll and congratulations to your thank parents, you, yeah. too. We know they don't get to Eagle alone, so thank you. Okay, the following students won awards. Oh, this is for, I'm sorry, that one was for the music department. This is from the German department, or the world languages department. The following students won awards for National German Exam 2020. These awards are only for the upper German classes. German 1 will take the test in April. Congratulations to German 2 gold medal winner Grantham Gallier, also eligible to compete for the four-week study trip to Germany. Oh, that's right, awesome. Grantham here. Okay. Are you going to do that Germany thing? Uh, I'm going to apply for it. Okay, cool. Stay up here while I read them off. <laughs> Silver medal, James Dalton. James here. Okay, let's give a round of applause for James. Okay, this one is a long name. Bronze medal, Benedictus Bialakis. Velasquez. Velasquez. Sorry. It's a long one. Okay, here. 
Oh, and Andrea Eckhart. <laughs> Achievement Medal, Hunter Fitch, Jonathan Van Dossel, and Clarice Such. No? <laughs> Honors German three gold medal Katja Maywood. Kachi. Kachi. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, hon. Did we say that right? Yeah. Okay. He did, not me, right? <laughs> she didn't sound convincing. He's like, she's like, stop. Silver medal Victoria Hansen. Victoria here. Medal Ryan Locke. Okay. Congratulations, Thank you. To Congratulations, all pictures, students. parents. <laughs> We're good. Everybody's laughing. They don't know which camera to look at. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Staff recognition. This is exciting. At the Illinois School Psychologist Association Convention on January 30th, 2020, Pushpa Winbush, RB School Psychologist, was named Practitioner of the Year. Congratulations. <laughs> Winbush submitted correspondence this uh, afternoon. She lives in Aurora, and so with the weather and, and the roads, she asked if uh, she can have a pass tonight, but she wanted to thank the board for the invitation and the recognition. At the end of January, RB's first assistant superintendent achieved another milestone in her career. On January 31st, 2020, Kristen Smetana earned her doctorate degree in educational leadership. Congratulations. Cost as much money as your diploma. <laughs> That's it for recognition. That is. Is. Doctor. Is that Mary? Don't forget to bring your stethoscope to school tomorrow. All right, we're going to start with doing association reports. My next favorite, my favorite thing. Oh, boy, here they come. Favorite reports. Long time no see. Yeah, we just, oh, spent, just spent a lot of time with two of you. Yeah. I'd, like, yeah. I'd like to acknowledge a uh, special guest, uh, my daughter, Molly. Where's Molly? Molly. 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 Oh, she's the one shaking her head. She's like, damn. So, That's your dad. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want a picture or anything? You got to say, oh. <laughs> Did you want a picture? Okay, well. Uh, so you already know who we are. We probably don't need to do introductions again. Just read it. Taylor, it's always good to start it with an introduction, just in case yes. the audience and then watch yes. it on TV. Um, I'm Taylor Jurgens, uh, president of Student Association. I'm Catherine. I'm the director of communications for Student Association. Omar Padilla, student spokesperson on Student Association. And yeah, we have a decent amount going on right now, so we just wanted to update you on what we're doing. Um, we recently had our blood drive, which was Wednesday, February 19th. And we had 89 pints of blood which donated, which was really good. Our goal was 100, though. Um, however, we had to, we were asked to um, cut, uh, sit, oh, what's it called? Uh, let go, like not allow um, certain donors to do after seventh period. To, to some, um, we had, were asked to close earlier than usual, but that was okay because we still had 89, and um, otherwise we would have reached our goal, but it was still a really good success. Um, it went really smoothly this time, which was really good. And then also we have our dance and pep rally coming up, which is next week. So our dance is March 7th, and the theme is neon, and it's 
A new thing at our B, so it's um, this we're calling it Spring Formal. So we're hoping it'll be a success. We've been publicizing it um, to everyone, and we've had a lot of positive feedback, and a lot of people seem to be really interested. And then our pep rally is on the Friday before, um, so that's when we have more games, and we are incorporating a new idea, which is the <laughs> Senior Guys Dance. They had their first practice yesterday, and <laughs> it looks really good. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so hopefully, you guys can see that when it comes the final thing. We'll definitely record it. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so around February, like around Valentine's Day, we received a word about a man who just turned 104 and he's a veteran and all he wanted was Valentine's Day cards. So um, around our Valentine's Day meeting, we all made cards for him and sent him. His name is Mr. White. Like I said, he's 104 and he was a veteran. I think he received a Purple Heart Award. So we were able to sent him those valentines to see how many he could get. So. He fought in Iwo Jima? Yes. Cool. Wow. Where does he live? Is California. He California. California, okay. So he may have more than And then we also have our Pop Top collection coming up soon. It is our annual Pop Top collection. We'll start collecting after spring break, and this year we're doing it a little differently. We're having um, three separate collection days to try and encourage people to not just hold them off to the last day so we're not scrambling to get them all counted. But they all go to the Ronald McDonald House, um, which if you don't know is for families who have ill or seriously injured um, children in the, at Loyola. So it's just right over there, and all of the pop-tops we give to them so they can uh, benefit from that. So about at the beginning of the month, we had a custodian appreciation day, so we usually do it annually. This year we actually, Taylor had some great ideas and we changed it up a little bit. So instead of doing, we usually do like a luncheon type party. This year we did like different goodie bags because it, would be, it was really hard to figure out like which workers were available at certain times. And so we did like goodie bags with those candies and different types of stuff. And we also decorated their door down beneath. So we put, we, I always, every year we do pause with their names. We decorated with little swirls. We made a bunch of banners and got everyone to sign up lunch. So it was really nice. We're going to continue to do that. And then also we had uh, Kindness Week. You guys probably heard about that. It was run by our, actually our social services. So our social workers asked us to take part in making posters for specifically our custodians, our staff. And so it was really nice because we were able to like, bring our club to like, thank everyone around the school. And so like, that was really cool. And I also wanted to mention that you guys did a fantastic job on Saturday. Thanks, Omar. Omar <laughs> 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 was great. I love Omar. Yeah. 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 I honestly think that it went really well. And I think it was really interesting and neat to like learn how what different ideas we have and then how can we respectfully bring them together. Say there are more comments yeah. on that. I feel like it was just very beneficial to, again, have like another closer like connection relationship with like our school community and our board and there was like a bunch of teachers too there which was really cool to like, have everyone's input and like different like perspectives on everything which is really nice. You both did an excellent job. Yeah. Thank you. Is that any other questions for student association? <laughs> What's coming up? Besides, okay the dance, any March, what else? Um, yeah, pop tops. Um, we have more some some more spirit days coming up, so we'll have one in, we already have one in February. St. Patrick's. Um, yeah, we have one for St. Patrick's theme, which is March 17th. Um, and then April, we're still deciding, we're trying to make a fun theme. And same with May, <coughs> here they're going to do May 1st or May 4th, because we kind of like um, made it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but AP, AP test at that time, so it's a little difficult, but yeah. And also, I think uh, the Tuesday of finals, we're going to the Ronald McDonald yeah. House yeah. to make cookies after finals just you know they have a bunch of different people come in and so you know the residents can have a treat yeah we should do like every time after like round finals okay thank you great job guys thank you yeah i think that's all that's left is those two that's all right President's report. I don't have a report. The superintendent's report. Superintendent's report. Curriculum Advisory Council. No update. Uh, facilities Advisory Council. Kristen uh, had the bid opening today for the mechanical unit that will be going on top of the auxiliary gymnastics room. It's the small room. 
next to our gymnastics room, it required a small standalone uh, HVAC unit. So that bid opening was this afternoon, and she'll discuss that later in the agenda. Uh, in regards to uh, the, an IGA with Riverside, the board has discussed in closed session on a few times under school safety, um, you know, trying to generate an intergovernmental agreement with local municipalities to address uh, a concern with uh, the police radios and in our building. Um, I received a intergovernmental agreement from Riverside and uh, our attorney is working with their attorney on some of the particular details. Uh, the board's current share of cost right now is 25,000, which is approximately 38% of the project, 39% of the project. Um, President Smithing negotiated those terms uh, with, well, President Sells from uh, Riverside uh, negotiated the terms with uh, President Smithing, uh, Hugh Hermanek from North Riverside, and Kit Ketchmark from Brookfield. So uh, those are the terms that were laid out in the IGA. Uh, I'll let Wes address if he wants to add anything to that. But I do not have a finalized IGA to put on the agenda for formal review or action at this time. Um, right, so it appears it, it didn't go well at the uh, Brookfield Town uh, Village uh, meeting <coughs> last night, and they are not in favor of the intergovernment agreement. So it appears to me that Ben has more work to do. So it's his, it's his um, deal. So can so we, we'll see, we'll so see what's your sense of general time frame then? Well, you know, I, it's tough to say, you know, we're hoping by summer. Mm -hmm. So that would be, that would be my general, I, it's really, it's a Ben question. And this just happened last night. Were they not so I haven't talked the, to Ben today. Were they not in favor of the today. agreement or of the amount? The amount of money. It was a money thing. It was a money thing. far apart would you say might be it's tough to say because I wasn't there I, I wish I was there but I, I, got, I got tied up and um, it appears that it's uh, a considerable amount. you know my, my just personal my personal opinion you know I think it's been going on too long and it's just a uh, um, I get a bit nervous thinking you know if we kick this and I, I understand there point of trying to be responsible with you know with money but we, we, I think the safety potential safety uh, or downside is a, uh, uh, a big liability my, my personal opinion um, uh, and I haven't spoken to anybody about this is you know we ought to consider uh, just making it happen so we're we would be paid 25,000 how much did we ask Brookfield? Fourteen. Uh, fourteen. Yeah, I and think the terms of the Riverside agreement. fourteen and Riverside were fourteen. I think yeah. that was the that was the, the And North split. Riverside is a yes? North Riverside already has said yes. And Brookfield's not happy with the amount. Okay. Right. right. So Chief Weitzel presented clear. Chief Weitzel presented this at the Brookfield town yesterday. Last they're they're, they're they're his radios. Mm -hmm. So we'll uh, okay. having said that. I suspect Ben will come back and we'll, we'll talk about what we need to do and how we can do that. We are coming into budget season, so we'll see what, what we can do. Yeah, we got to find out why Brookfield is reticent to do that. I mean, do they have good reason? Do they not like the technology? Do they not like the equipment? I think, they their, I think their assumption and their feeling is that we should pay for it. The school board should pay for it. All of it? That's what I got from the um, I don't think they want conversations. But I was not at the... Yeah, they, they don't want to pay anything. Right. Um, that's an unknown. So, like I said, we'll just go back, back to, to go back, back, right. back, back to one. I mean, it's not, it's not done. It's not out of the woods. It's not, not going to happen. Maybe we value engineer the project. Maybe we move it to a different, a different look, a different feel. Maybe we, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of variables to do besides the, the big, you know, we have to get it done yesterday. Is, School's been here 100 years. But there, there is agreement, or is there agreement from public safety in Brookfield that it needs to get done? Or I don't know why they're pushing so hard. Okay, I mean, that I think would be my follow-up question as to what their objection is. Right. Is it about... Well, you had a call into the mayor, correct? 
I did. I did have a call in, in, in the, you know, I tried to reach out to Ben. I didn't get a whole, whole, whole with him today. I, you know, I, 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 I missed Kit. He, him and I text back and forth, and I just missed it. I was just working today. So. Yeah, I think there might be a misconception that we're sitting with all this cash that we're not using. And, um, but as was presented, you know, by Kristen, you know, I think uh, the last meeting or the meeting before, you know, that, that goes in cycles. So we're, we're, we're not this cash cow, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, it just seems like it's been going on for quite a bit. And um, before oh. I got on the board, me, Deanna and Tom got on the board. And this isn't any um, critique or criticism of anybody prior. This is just the nature of negotiations. No, I, with, I get it. No, we, we had <laughs> chasing the same dollars with, um, you know, the state or, you know, different revenue yeah. and it's agreed I mean, we have a dollar amount at this point there's a plan yeah and mm -hmm. if, if the public safety professionals could agree that the plan needs to be executed I, mean, I, I absolutely agree we need to move forward so. yeah we have to find out why Brookfield mm -hmm. which is a major player is not on board with this plan that seems odd so I, if it's a public safety plan I think we plan, moved pretty I mean as, as a uh, as a board we moved pretty quickly you know Ben came and said look we this is a, a thing we're talking about. This I was like, well, we we didn't. This isn't in our budget, you know. Our budget season starts. And he was like, we really want to get this done now. And I said, well, let's talk about how to do that. And I think we came up with an agreement. I thought there was an intercompany agreement. Intergovernment. Intergovernment agreement. So, sorry, I'm just interrupting. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> okay. that's my 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 private life coming out. Um, you know, and and and. I don't know if that was negotiated outside of the trustees or they weren't informed or, you know, these are questions I cannot answer. But um, obviously it was not um, the deal that they wanted, so. Well, just to clarify, though, we did not set up the terms. No. No, this was best. This isn't something where you said, hey, you guys each pay 14 and we'll pay 25. That's not, not my... All right, Mr. Sells is... is the chief architect. The chief architect. And it is a negotiation, and it is an intergovernmental agreement, and those things typically don't happen overnight. I think we're still, you know, this newest um, thing, came, this newest piece came to light just last night, right? So there still are more conversations that need to be had. Right. I mean, it's not, it's not, not going to happen. It's just what does it look like? And, what does the money shake out, and how does that how does that play into the future of of the school? You know, is it is it a one year, two year? I mean, it's you know, there's two different floors on the deal. So, I had talked briefly with Chief Whitesell, and uh, <coughs> his take was, you know, he shared with them that there was an intergovernmental agreement. Some of the trustees did not appear to know that there was an intergovernmental, you know, it had gotten as far as the intergovernmental agreement. Um, he shared with them the, you know, the dollar amounts. Um, I think their biggest concern was setting a precedent that if any other schools in their community had this issue that they would be responsible to have to pay some portion for all those schools. And they're, they're the why do we have this issue in the first place? What, what do you? Like, well, why do they not work? Why do we have to get new ones? Well, hundred-year-old building. Because we had a, we had a, so that we had a. I mean, our building's been here for a very long time. In 2014, fit the police department shifted from a wide band radio frequency to a narrow band radio frequency when they combined it for the WC3, and uh, there were some issues with the band frequency. First, Riverside changed over to that frequency and eventually everybody was shifting over to that frequency. And that shift over to that frequency caused some issues in, in primarily the basement. And so, um, I, I just the same concern that the board had was, hey, if every time they change a the frequency, are we gonna be on the hook to buy new repeaters? You know, so I, I think uh, everybody is, is obviously probably showing some caution. Um, but well, I think my point just being that we did not take any action that caused these not to work. It was a change in frequency band, whatever it is. 
Yeah. Correct. Right? Correct. So shouldn't we be hesitant to set a precedent that we're going to pay more than 40% when it wasn't our actions that... You see what I'm saying? Like, sure. It's just the opposite side of it. Right. I mean, we're already paying for it. Well, that's why it's a negotiation. Well, right. That's right. right. That's why it's right. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and not to defend Brookfield at all, but they, they have two high schools and four grade schools, right? So... Well, yeah, I mean, if you're you Riverside use, sending, like, 42 kids, and they're going to pay the same amount. I would say... Five, well, more, yeah, more that's more. an exaggeration. I don't know how many <laughs> like Riverside sends. No, but... But it's less than Brookfield. Uh, no, the right. percentage of students sure. coming from North Riverside is far lower. Right. Well, I think the point is we oh we thought we had yes. a, an, an agreement. We thought it was We done don't done have an agreement. Done. At some point, I will we'll circle right. back with the gentleman and we'll figure out what that looks like and we'll come back okay. and talk about it at a board meeting because it's not. Yeah. Yes. To your point, it's not going to go away. Well, and the fact it's that it's, it's a known um, uh, weak weak link, or right. potentially a known risk. Known risk. Right. right. I think time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. I think it's, you know, you got to keep on, try to keep on budget, but uh, possibly make an exception for something like this. Um, and I don't know if this is the proper, you know, we could talk further in closed session, uh, but um, yeah, I think it's been going on too long. And, uh, I, just, I think, I think, we're, I think there's some room for uh, discussion. I tried to. I, I did speak briefly with the village manager from Riverside and said, "Hey, we're pretty close to getting this done. I wouldn't let this uh, ruin the progress we made." She said she doesn't have negotiation ability, so she was, you know, going to defer that to President Sells, and he was going to reach out to Wes. So I mean, I'll do whatever you guys, whatever the board's uh, pleasure is. You know what? You have an agreement with Riverside if they uh, change frequencies sometime in the next couple of years that they agree to, you know, a higher percentage uh, you know, of our cake. Um, it, I don't know if that's a compromise. Well, you put language in there that any future change needs to be a mutual agreement. Yeah, yeah. we were looking I at think some that, of this yeah, Honestly, that's, that's all I was going I mean, mm -hmm. like, the terms of the IGA were pretty solid. I think there was one or two sections that, when I received it from the village, um, they actually, do, uh, after we sent our comments back, they were just going to connect our district attorney with the village attorney, and it was more or less on that future maintenance. And in the event, yeah, frequencies changed in the future, you know, we would renegotiate the percentages or something like that. But it wasn't. I mean, other other than that, we were fine with the twenty five thousand and yeah, getting and it done. Had, and we had said we, you know, we there was language we put in there about upkeep and so forth that we would maintain. There was some directive by them, and that we would pay. We're like, well, okay, we're gonna pay. We'll just, we'll just do it. So that was, that was some of the language. But it wasn't, it wasn't done. It wasn't, un, it wasn't about the money. <coughs> no, I mean, the program was just about the money. But we should clarify that it was the, even the first draft of the IJ was not initiated by the school district. Right. Right. And Chief Weitzel presented the radios. So okay. Uh, thank you, Wes, for the yeah, negotiations. You. It's an uh, awkward nice. spot to try to get uh, multiple bodies. We've we'll come a long way. It's only been, you know, we've only been, I've only been here less than a year. So I think that's a good place to be. Finance Advisory Council is scheduled to meet on uh, March 2nd to review financial projections um, and discuss any impacts of staffing. Uh, Personnel Advisory Council. Uh, no update. I communicated with them today uh, on a brief update. That will be shared in closed session. Um, Policy Advisory Council, uh, I did receive a question about, you know, it is on our radar. I do have that policy pulled. Uh, the Policy Council usually meets on a quarterly basis. Uh, so I have 2 colon 220 pulled so that we can discuss our voting procedures. Um, I also got a question about tonight with the consent agenda. So traditionally, a consent agenda is on our business meeting. And so we talked about this a little bit last meeting, but traditionally, what we, <coughs> hopefully the way we can set the majority of things up would be, if you see them at the committee of the whole, we you know address them, discuss questions, and then at the business meeting, they'll be on a consent agenda. So when we have a committee of the whole, if there's something we need to vote on, Marianne calls it a, a committee of the whole and a special meeting of the board. 
Um, so we haven't historically put a consent on both agendas. Um, if there's a lot of items, we eventually could do that, but I think uh, we still need to discuss this a little bit more in the policy, but I would imagine that this would get addressed in the next month or so. Thank you. And then purchase, lease, or land advisory council. Uh, there's another meeting later this week with the zoo uh, to review a, another drawing that they requested. And that's all I have from uh, the superintendent's report. Principal's report. Good evening, honorable board members of District 208. Here's the principal report and how we're winning every week here at RB. Six family and career and community leaders of America, RB students, qualified to compete at state. Additionally, Junior Autumn Hat Penny won her event Frosted Cake with a perfect score and a most outstanding award. Shout out to Ms. Farley and Ms. Walmart. Just a few weeks ago, the wrestling team and girls basketball team became regional champions. It was the first girls title in nine years. The wrestling team is actually competing right now against Brother Rice for a chance to go down to Evergreen Park. And the girls are competing against Chicago Kenwood for a shot at the sectional finals. Harrison Nolan, a sophomore, qualified for the swimming and diving state competition this upcoming weekend after finishing first place at the Lions Township sectional. State will be held February 28th and 29th at Evanston Township High School. Congratulations to the robotics team and chess team for having competed at state this past weekend. Also, just a week ago, the math team competed in the Illinois Council of Teachers of Math Regional Competition at Concordia University. We had three students finish in the top five in their individual competitions. Ethan Damano and Felix Jacques tied for fourth in the geometry competition and Kane Gazana placed fifth in the Algebra 2 competition. The Algebra 2 team of Noah Britt, Luca Franceschina, Kane Gonzalez, Jack Jamison, Ryan Lack, and Isabel Linares placed second. The Geometry team of Stephen Berger, Ethan Demano, Gillian Dowling, <coughs> Felix Jack, Caroline Morero, and Claire Schroeder placed third. The Earls team of Noah Britt and Josh Turner placed third. The Principal Student Advisory Board meeting will be held tomorrow, February 26th, during lunch times. The Principal Student Advisory Board is an open forum for students to speak to me about the issues that are important to them. This is a census year, census 2020. Beginning in mid-March, people will receive a notice in the mail to complete the 2020 census. Once you receive it, you can respond online. In May, the U.S. Census Bureau will begin following up in person with households that haven't responded to the census. For more information, please visit our website and click Census 2020 for more information. The spring musical, Big Fish, runs from Thursday, February 27th through Sunday, March 1st. RB also, RB will be hosting a concert with Hauser Junior High on Thursday, March 5th from 7 to 9 p.m. Excuse Bless me. You. The next coffee with the principal will be held on Thursday, March 12th at 9 a.m. Lastly, the RBEF Telethon Fundraiser will be held on Saturday, March 14th from 1 to 9 p.m. The program will be viewed live on rbtv.tv. For those that want to support, you may be able to dial in and give a monetary donation. There will also be live performances, so please tune in. Are you performing? What are those performances, Dr. Yeah, are you performing, Dr. Freda? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I have committed to dance salsa with my wife in front of wow. our community live on TV. Wow. You know, I'll do anything to, um, for our school, for our community. Anything that Be careful for. what you say. <laughs> <laughs> and that concludes my principal's report. You have a couple of uh, presentations tonight, correct? I do, I do. I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Kylie Nichols and Bridget Wilmot and the teachers as well for the blended learning blended learning presentation. Come on up, guys, come on up. You guys can pull some of those extra chairs up, Bridget, whatever you need. I might go to school, though. <laughs> Mr. Davis, I like the shirt. Thank you. I don't think it'll fit. I don't think it'll fit, but <laughs> oh, he's, he is a 
Yes. Very stylish. Very well dressed all the time. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I don't know. Like he almost like he said that like it was not. No, I like the shirt. And I'm like, yeah. I don't think sure. I could wear it to a board meeting. Sure, he's a snappy dresser. Sure, you could. So we can do anything you want, this guy. I'm excited for this. I'm talking blended learning and Bridget. You might have to cut. You might have to cut. Bridget, did you? I mean, did you go to the conference? I was there yesterday and I'm going tomorrow. Yeah. They're on, they're on like a dedicated time. I get they have fix it up to a certain amount of time. <laughs> Yeah. The only one you're holding up is me. I got to go back to okay. shopper. Yeah. Bridges. Hi, everyone. Who started? Bridges or Kyle? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. So, hi, everyone. I'm Bridget Wilmot, the Instructional Tech Coordinator, and I also teach one section, Honors English 10, Blended Learning. So, just to give you an overview of what blended learning is, essentially, it's a combination of online face to face instruction. So a teacher designs a unit and they may de designate certain days within the unit depending on the student's needs as flex days. So on those flex days, some students are allowed to leave the classroom, they can go to the library, they can go to the atrium to continue their studies online. While the students who are in the classroom are still working with the teacher through small group or individualized instruction. So the blended learning pilot, it gives a lot of freedom and a lot of choice to students. And then it also allows teachers to do a lot of differentiation, which is pretty amazing. So we asked students, because this is the first year that we're running this pilot in the fall, what they thought. We surveyed them. Response, overwhelmingly positive. 97% of the students said they thought we should continue on the <laughs> pilot. And then we, when we asked students, would you have chosen to take this class as a blended class or a traditional class? 90% of them said they would have chosen to take it as a blended class. Mm -hmm. So Michelle, I'm gonna turn it over to her. She's gonna talk about uh, the student experience a little bit more and she teaches AP Bio Blended. Hi, my name is Michelle Kaler. I've been teaching here for 16, 17 years now. Um, but I thought I'd tell you a little bit about kind of why I chose to do it and then what I'm doing now and kind of where I see this going in the future. So initially I decided to apply for AP Bio to be part of the blended flex pilot to allow for better student engagement and differentiation in my AP Bio class. AP Bio has gone through many curriculum changes in the 16 years that I've been teaching it. And in the last few years, the biggest changes that I've seen have been more emphasis on inquiry and student lab design. I sum it up as students thinking and acting like scientists. This is one of the many reasons I decided to change my teaching style to a flipped classroom years ago. For those of you that don't know, a flipped classroom is an instructional strategy and a type of blending learning that reverses the traditional learning environment by delivering instructional content often online outside of the classroom. And it moves um, activities more so what would have been considered homework to inside of the classroom so that the teacher can focus more on where students are going wrong and kind of give a more individualized um, assessment and kind of help with them. So with class sizes on the higher end and utilizing all the lab space I would uh, have in my classroom, I would have in the past eight lab groups in each period with three or four students per group. And uh, students would end up getting lost in the crowd, as I would say. Uh, they would be sitting back and letting other members of their group do the work for them. In the flexed approach, it allows me to focus more closely on student groups because now I have less students in the classroom. Normally I would have three or four lab groups with three individuals in those lab groups. And with fewer students, I could see that every single student was engaged. I could also hear many things going right and or wrong before it gets too late. So I can address misconceptions, I can address errors in lab design, or other things, even from the other side of the room. In the past, with a very full classroom, I could not do that until it was too late when I'm looking at lab reports, and then I'm trying to jump back and correct things for them. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, this is vital for me um, in the fact that now the students are going to be more hands-on. No student can get lost in the crowd anymore because in May, they are assessed on these lab activities that we're working with. So the fact that every student has to have now a hands-on approach definitely helps. One of the things that I do to set up my lab groups for the week is that my students are able to 
um, keep track of their daily assignments and activities on Schoology, and they also fill out a flex day reflection form. It, for me, it has to be turned in every Sunday, so I set up my lab groups. I use this form as a follow-up of who gets it and who doesn't. This formative assessment allows me to set up my groups and differentiate my instruction based on the needs of my students. So I will rearrange groups based on students who need a little bit more work. I'm going to keep them together and have their in-class time be structured a little bit differently than some of my other student groups. This works out really well because this is anonymous to uh, other students in the class and they aren't afraid to ask questions online that they're unsure about. Uh, the other thing I see this going for in the future as we get closer to the AP exam, my student groups will be structured around different topics that those students feel like they need a little bit more help with in regards to review. Kevin Divis, who teaches in the math department, is now going to discuss kind of the why in regards to this pilot and the feedback we've received. Okay. Uh, welcome to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry. Many people uh, may ask why, as teachers, we took this risk to be part of this pilot. Uh, the teachers who are part of this pilot put a lot of time into this. Uh, for myself, and I know as well for others, we were really seeking an opportunity to leverage the technology that you guys invested in. Uh, we wanted to use that technology in a way that we could really differentiate the learning experience for the students. For me, personally, the greatest appeal was really being able to innovate my classroom in a way that helped build soft skills such as prioritizing time, being accountable for your own work, and learning how and when to collaborate when left on your own. Uh, those skills are the skills that I think are really going to prepare students for the college and post-college reality of being a modern learner. Uh, in the student survey that Bridget mentioned, 110 students opted to answer an open-ended question about what they liked about the program. Of those 110 students, 73 in some way mentioned the freedom and the choice that they were given. The students liked that they had a choice in the space in which they were learning, the pace at which they were able to learn, and the ability to prioritize their work. When asked what exactly are you doing when you're out on those flex days, 60% of students noted that most of the time, uh, or all of the time, they were working on the content that was for that course. So for instance, in my honors pre-calc course, uh, if it's a flex day, 60% of those students are saying they're working on honors pre-calc. They also provide feedback as to what they were working on when they're not working on the content of the course. And the most common responses were that they were studying for another class, prioritizing homework a little bit differently, or had already completed the assignment for that day. The assignments never go uncompleted, so that 40% weren't working on it during that, that class period. Uh, they're still doing the homework. They're just doing it when the student is mentally prepared for that content. Uh, for instance, again, in my seventh hour blended pre-calc, seventh hour, we're mentally drained at that point, uh, many students may be exhausted because it's the end of the day. Uh, these flex days serve as a great opportunity for students to work on a different set of homework, something that's still engaging, but engaging in a different way. Because math at the end of the day sometimes is just not what you want to be working on. Ultimately, that makes a better value for their time because they can then say, you know, I'm going to work on reading this book now, and then when I'm in the mindset of math, I'll work on math. And you're going to get more out of it at that point. Uh, that's all I have to say. So I'm going to pass this over to Kathleen, who's going to talk on the rapport and relationship building that's possible due to blended learning. Hi, I'm Kathleen Harsey. Uh, I'm an English teacher here. This is my 15th year teaching at RB. Uh, 17 years of teaching and it's changed a whole lot while I've been um, in this career. Uh, I teach the uh, co-taught English 10, uh, which means I teach, uh, I'm the content teacher and then Mark Ori is the special education teacher. Uh, and then I teach AP language and composition. So, and that has been kind of my schedule uh, for almost as long as I've been here where I've had AP students and then, you know, some form of um, co-taught students or back in the day it was a loop, some, you know, kind of bookending all kinds of learners in the building. Um, and so I would say the common denominator for all of that is always relationships. Um, and I know that's a little cliche coming from an English teacher, you know, where we spend, you know, a lot of our time in, uh, in a poem <laughs> and ideas, <laughs> you know. So I know that that uh, sometimes with technology for myself personally, I, don't, I as a teacher don't gravitate towards technology naturally. Um, so 
uh, I need to make sure that I make a concerted and direct effort to do that because the world is, uh, you know, moving beyond what just my inclinations are as a teacher. So um, I would say that uh, the reason that sometimes I, as a teacher, push back against technology is that I fear, you know, that it kind of erodes at relationships. Um, but this, with flex learning, I have found that it really is the opposite, that it provides the opportunity to move past just sort of the banter that we're able to have with our students. It's a strength of you know most teachers here in the building. But I have found that really that it's promoting academic language as well. Um, and oftentimes with our students that typically uh, don't feel comfortable talking in that kind of language. So my AP students, you know, even if they don't necessarily know what they're saying, a lot of times they're good at student behaviors where they've learned to kind of parrot that language. Um, in my co-taught class, I would say that there are kids like that, but oftentimes they struggle with that. And I would say um, that because the size of the room of who's in the room and it's transient, you know, depending on the week, it's not the same. It's not the same small group of students. Um, but I would say that it's, uh, you know, it's a smaller group. It's differentiated as far as the types of learners that are in the room. Um, and then because there's two of us, it gives us the freedom also to check on the other students. That's kind of unique to the co-taught model, but that's also a strength as well. So it sort of feels like we are everywhere with them at all times. Uh, so that's been really nice too, because it doesn't feel like we're just pushing them out. You know, it feels like uh, we're able to rotate and sort of have a community that's built in our classroom and then around the building. Um, and just one last thing I wanted to say too, my experience with this is that uh, Bridget's leadership with this truly I think is why so many of us have gotten on board with it. Uh, her rapport just with us allows because uh, she's in the classroom still that it allows us to not always be so great at it so you know after 17 years of teaching you know I can do certain things without uh, you know rereading it I can recite a few poems for you please don't ask me to do that right now yeah. um, <laughs> God, no, please don't. Um, but you know this kind of thing you know I don't always feel comfortable not being great at something you know I, I always want to be great at it so um, because of Bridget's sort of relationship with all of us um, and in the building you know her uh, willingness to support us and sort of you know encourage our sense of humor about this and sort of hold it all kind of lightly allows for I think sort of our own relationships and academic learning to grow as teachers which then role models it to our students as well you know so that's the thing that uh, Mark and I have found frequently is that we're actually narrating kind of what's going on which then allows us to be human in front of them in sort of you know an again an academic way that has been uh, really enriching for all of us so Great. Yep. And then we also have two of our members of the Blended Pilot. So Deirdre, if you want to introduce yourself. I'm Deirdre Sullivan. I teach Spanish to Blended first period. And um, we're really grateful for your support on uh, the program because it's been extremely valuable for our students. So thank you. And then we also have Amy Phillips, who is our librarian. And she and, our, she and the library staff are integral in providing a space for our students to go where they are supervised and can work. And then, of course, Kathleen mentioned Mark, her teaching partner. And then we also have Tom Dignan, who's in the English department, as well as Lori Sullivan and Melissa Carmona, who are in the science department. Okay. So on a somewhat related but not blended learning note, this is the handout that Kevin had asked me to pass out to everyone. So this is regarding the Bright Bites survey results. So this is a survey that we do every year, and it helps us see how technology is impacting student achievement. So if you take a look at the overview, you can see that schools get a score from 800 to 1300, an overall score, and then a score on four different domains, which are bulleted there, classroom use of tech, access, skills, and environment. So I always find it's a little bit easier if you get these numbers in context. So if you take a look at down at the table below, you can see uh, RB is at an 1116 overall score, which is advanced. It's a really strong, solid score. And if you look at the comparison to the numbers of the Illinois average and the national average, we are well above that. And then if you look to in each of the four domains, it's pretty exciting to see that we're above the Illinois average and the national average in all four of those domains. So this is the fourth year we've given the survey. Every year our score goes up and up and up, which is really exciting to see. So I think that score combined with what you heard from our blended learning pilot members and then just all the work that our staff, all of our staff members here at RB are doing with integrating tech, it's really providing a pretty amazing <coughs> education experience for students. Teacher, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Spanish. 
<clears throat> How's it working with blended? Because isn't like, I mean, like being an old school, when you take a foreign language, it's rep repetition, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, except, you know, um, there's obviously some changes with act film and what they expect, so it's not the drill and kill procedure that was always done in the traditional ways of learning a language. Um, but like tomorrow, for instance, my students are um, working on a program called Flipgrid, and they have to um, they have to give details about the last vacation that they went on with their family. And it's a wonderful program because it allows them to respond to each other through a video format. And um, anyway, so it's been, it's been wonderful. The other thing too is it allows for mastery within um, the assessments that we have. Um, I've always given the students an opportunity to retake formative assessments, but not all of them will take advantage of it because it means them coming in on their time to relearn the topics with me, you know, before or after school, and they have sports or they have other commitments. And um, what it does is it allows an opportunity for the students to come in then during the flex day where they're there anyway. Um, if any of my students have a 75% or below, they have to be in the classroom with me anyway because then it gives me a chance to work with them and make sure that they're where they need to be, like I said, to, to reach mastery and different topics that we're, we're learning. So um, it's So been, you've been doing this all, all year, correct? All year, um, and <coughs> I started out just having the students gone once a week. Um, I'm rolling into twice a week. I had the opportunity to go to Huntley this past um, month. Uh, uh, it was actually last week. And um, to view what they have, uh, observe their campus, because they've been doing it for so long. Um, and then confer with their Spanish two and three and Spanish four teachers who also are practicing the same things. But again, the mastery of the subject matter is really critical because um, you know, you encourage the students, but if they're not gonna come in during their time um, after or before school, it's hard. Uh, to confirm that they've understood the material. But now they have to be there, and they don't have a choice but to make sure that they, they gain an understanding. Okay, great. Sorry, Gina. Can I ask, how many classrooms are participating in the pilot? We have eight classes, nine teachers. So approximately almost 200 students. 200 students. And teachers volunteer to take part? Yes, this is all, this is your coalition of the willing here. <laughs> <laughs> the put innovators. themselves out there yeah. and take a major risk because none of us knew where this program was going. So I have to say, I, these are brave teachers who want to do what's best for their students and said, okay, I'll try this and see how it goes. So what would be next steps to expand? Yeah, that was my I knew, well, that was your, I knew that was your question. Right, like, I, you, so you, you this is great. Uh, done site visits and you continue to do site visits to see what others in the area are doing. You meet as a cohort to figure out what's working, what's not, right? Where do we see this going next? Yeah. And us, do we have any feedback from families, from parents? Because it's a little different. They might worry that concepts are not being taught in the traditional way that they are used to. Are mm -hmm. parents feeling secure? Yeah, so to answer the first question, I think the biggest issue for expansion for us is space. At some point, we need to find places to put the students when they're going out of the classroom. So right now, we have the library, we have the atrium, but if we expand, those spaces won't be able to accommodate those students anymore. So spaces, uh, furniture, supervision, I think those are the major infrastructure. Uh, we've been really lucky with Kylie and the rest of the administration supporting the PD, so I feel like we've had a lot of opportunities to work together, go to conferences, um, and really have a chance to figure out this pilot. As far as parents, I haven't heard from any teachers that there has been any parent pushback. We sent a letter home to parents and actually all the students in individual classes, they had to sign a contract and their parents had to sign a contract that outlined the expectations very clearly. We did have some parents who did not sign the contract, whether that's because the student just didn't want to return the contract. And of course, those students are still going through and having the same traditional classroom experience they're getting all of the content, all of the material. They're just not leaving the class. 
So if they didn't sign a contract, they stay with these teachers all five periods, like Abs a traditional school day. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And if they don't meet a minimum grade requirement, the cohort minimum is 75%, although some of us have it higher or have added other criteria. So if they don't meet that criteria, they're in the classroom as well. So really students who are leaving are the ones who have shown that they can independently learn and do their assignments and uh, do the soft skills that Kevin mentioned, like time management, organization, et cetera. This might be a Kylie question. What would be the timeline if we wanted to expand this? When, when would we need to know that by? So we, Kevin and Bridget and I have already been talking expansion and, and what that looks like and what are some of the requirements um, to allow more people into the pilot and then also the idea of expanding sort of within the pilot. And we all feel really strongly that that has to be slow. Um, what you're not getting out of these people because they're not the kind of people that are going to tell you is that the amount of work that it takes to get a blended class up and running is unfathomable to me. Um, I'm talking about hundreds of hours of putting resources out for students to be able to access when they're not in the classroom. So for us to right now say to a staff member who's never done this, hey, do you want to try blended next year, would be next to impossible, in, in my opinion, because of the amount of work that they've put into it. We have talked about, um, in sort of our initial discussions about expansion, looking to potentially expand maybe a person within the pilot to have more than one class and see what that looks like. But when Bridget is talking about space, that's really our issue. With eight, um, with eight courses going a day, and, and Beth was kind enough to build the master schedule kind of around us so that um, there's one blended period uh, there's one blended class per period with the exception of second period. Since we have eight classes, seven periods a day, we had to double up there. Um, we're talking about Amy making some pretty um, big changes within the library to allow us to have space in the library for our kids to go. You'll see the students out in the atrium sitting on the benches, which is their favorite place to be, I think, a lot of them. Um, beyond that, we don't have places for kids to go. We don't have um, a commons area like Huntley does. We don't have an open campus. So we are going to run into, as much as we want to expand, we are gonna run into some fairly significant roadblocks with where do we put kids and who is supervising those kids. And that is really going to determine our ability to expand the pilot. We would certainly, we are excited about this. We're excited about the, the student feedback. I'm really excited about the work that this group of people is doing and the collaboration that I've seen from them and the willingness to take the risk. But we're going to meet a point where we kind of hit that, that wall and it's gonna be, okay, do we wanna continue with blended? Do we value this enough mm -hmm. to continue with it? Because as we get to that, it's going to require some financial commitment on our part. We're going to have to figure out who is going to supervise these kids, where are these kids going to go, what are they going to sit on, how is this going to function. We were able to do the pilot kind of limitedly you know, with our resources. Kristen was able to work with us to figure out some grant money so that we could kind of soup up the library a little bit. But we're going to reach a capacity where we have to say kind of as a district, is this something we want to keep doing and are we willing to finance some of what it would look like for us to keep doing that. Uh, would flexible, more flexible seating within your own classrooms be helpful for the space issue? Kevin, you have kind of a flexi sort of <laughs> space in your classroom with like that, well like with your whiteboard and yeah. your collaboration space, but. I don't think it would change the, the issue of having to have spaces where students could leave the classroom and go. Is that through. a requirement? I don't. Uh, I mean, in, in blended flex scheduling, yeah. that's the idea is that mm -hmm. during a class period that's a flex class period on a flex day, that they not be in that classroom and be able to work sort of independently away from the group. Uh, I think if they were in the same classroom, even if there was flexible seating, uh, you'd run into an issue of things like volume, uh, where, you know, if you're trying to do, like I do a little mini lesson on a lot of the flexible days, if you have other students who are working on other things, that might involve them having conversations that could become disruptive. Bridget, can I talk about yeah, my experience? Yeah. So, since I'm teaching AP Bio, I wanted to give all of my students the same experience and kind of going into the AP exam, since it is such a high stakes course. 
my sixth period is fully blended flex, so they have the ability to leave the classroom. My third period, AP Bio, does not. And so I am modifying and still teaching on a blended flexed situation. In my room, it's a little bit easier, but it's still re rather difficult. I have a lab classroom, so there's a demo desk in the middle and the lab tables and then kind of the traditional lecture area. But what I run into a ton is volume. It's loud, plus as I'm trying to do a mini lesson or go over homework, those kids in the like that have their flex time and should be working on stuff, they're hearing the answers. They're hearing me go through discussions and all that stuff. So they're, it's not the full experience. And so it has been rather challenging to try to do that, but I'm still trying to keep both of those courses together. So they come, so they come check in and then they go to the library or cafeteria or wherever it might be? So what I do is every Sunday I post my blended flex schedule for the week. I'll have two or three different groups. I'll call them just group A or group B or C. And they know for me, my sixth period, if they're going to the library, they don't have to check in. So they just leave my, they leave their fifth period class and they'll go to the library. It's my job to check in Skyward for attendance that those students who aren't in my room are showing up for the library and they are if they choose to go to the atrium that's when they check in with me and I as I'm standing in the hallway during passing period the students will come and say Mrs. Kaler I'm going to the atrium today I'm on flex and I'll just mark that down so that I know when I am doing attendance that they are present for the class day first period flex just stay at home and check in with you and then come in no Seems they still have to check in their teacher or the library. That's not right. But someone said it's something about open campus. I don't know who, who had said that. Like what? So what does that mean? That means kids can come and go. So like some Their campuses are open so like they get to go to McDonald's for lunch. Right? Some have open lunch, some have open all day. Right? right. It would be a shame to not expand this program because of space. Like right? Like, I'm absolutely. curious if there's other districts that have and come up with some done, innovative right? outside of the box ideas. Well, like Huntley, when they Such took me, classes, go stay home. <laughs> when they took me, uh, when Bridget, I went on the site visit with the group last year, and when Huntley redid their school, they had a couple commons areas, kind of like our atrium, but larger hallways or, you know, it's beautiful off, off the beaten path, like staircase, yeah. where they just put some tables and chairs, yeah. and seen that. a couple couches mm -hmm. and things like that. You know, we have, I mean, there are certainly, I, I'm, I'm the creep who like goes around the school and is like, oh, we could put some chairs in this stairwell. Like we yeah. have <laughs> some, some places, places right? Right? Yes. like we could, we could certainly, um, you know, expand some spaces with what we have, but we do, we would have to consider like, right, mm -hmm. the furniture, what are the kids sitting on, making sure that we have security. If I told Dave, I could feel Dave Mann looking at me right now <laughs> saying that I'm going to let kids go in the stairwells. <laughs> Yeah, um, we would have to, you know, yeah. we would really have to rethink what that looks like. But, you know, we, when you walk down the halls of Huntley, I mean, one, they're big enough to drive a car down, yeah. first sure. of all. But you see students in hallways, yes. right, with benches yes. and cafe-style tables and seating. Yes. And there are sort of kids everywhere you go in that mm -hmm. building. Um, and it has a very kind of commonsy college campus sort yeah, of feel to it. Yeah, it's like you're it. at the student center yeah, at yeah, college, yeah. right? Right. I do think, though, that's also a huge cultural shift for yes. RV. So when sure. we talk about that and we talk about a slow expansion, that would need a lot of yes. time, I think, mm -hmm. to take hold where we as a building would have to decide, do we feel comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. And also for the open campus, I just want to say Huntley, has they're very very open and transparent about the pros and the cons and actually when our last group was out there they have decided to start rolling back their open campus and not giving students as much a lot freedom. of liability yeah and keeping them in the building so you know i i really look to them of the lessons they've learned and they're starting to realize that perhaps they didn't want students to have that much freedom and maybe it's better if they're so is it just that there's a lack of space in the library um well there is a thing of i don't have quite enough chairs for as many students who mm -hmm. want to come into the library at any given period um also those chairs are fairly old and falling apart um when you sit in them they kind of creak um so there is that uh we're also looking at um, what I've met with some people about uh, new furniture and redesigning the library a little bit um, about uh, um, 
how, how we can see all the students for supervision. Mm -hmm. yes. We have lots Thank of you. tall shelves in our nonfiction area. Um, and one of the drawings that they submitted to me had shelves that were probably about four and a half or five feet tall instead of seven. Mm -hmm. um, so we can see over them. And also then moving them, if you've been into the library, there's a little back corner where it's a little hard to see. Um, and students like to hang out over there. Um, so even moving some of the shelving there so it becomes less of a hangout space. Um, more of a uh, storage or uh, library space. And then also using, um, I've moved a uh, temporary desk for myself over into the far side of the library to help with supervision as well. We're just having some uh, growing pains, I guess, in um, learn the, the students who are in study hall where that has been their space, uh, getting some more visitors and some more people in there. Um, it's becoming a much louder space than maybe you, your high school library was. Um, but to me, that signals collaboration and students learning how to use their own time um, in the way that they feel is more productive. So I guess one last question I have. Is there a distraction then? Because if students are kind of free to roam around, for other kids who are in the classroom, trying to learn and then they see people kind of walking the halls or so I asked um, I asked Neil Dugetti periodically and the most recent time that I asked him I said because that was kind of our concern right like kids roaming around the building that's why we very intentionally scheduled one period a day or one period at a time um, and I said you know have you had you know issues and has the noise been crazy or have you had discipline issues and he said if you hadn't told me there was a blended flex pilot going on we would have no idea so kudos to the students and the teachers really too for making the expectations very stringent because it really is a one time and you're out type of situation and the students have really honored and respected um, what is expected of them and we have not seen I mean uh, people tell me a lot of things that go wrong and so I feel like no one would really be afraid to come by and say like hey why are you doing this it's making me crazy we've had nothing but positive um, and and if kids are talking about blended they're talking about it because they want to be a part of it yeah we'll be and, oh I'm sorry I was just gonna say when students yeah. go to their location they Please are stay. stuck at that location so they aren't allowed to go wander throughout the halls at all so if we had multiple locations, though, do you need, I mean, like this year, I see, we do a pretty good job just administrators, teachers walk through the hall. Mm -hmm. I know any blended kids got the orange lanyard. Yep. Mm -hmm. I right, said so make it a point to kind of just check in and see what mm -hmm. they're doing, and they are on task. Mm -hmm. and there's been a couple occasions where I've stopped either on the stair. I mean, they might be laying down, and look, I thought they were, like, sleeping for a second, but <laughs> they're, they're, we're on task. Um, but if we did, like, so we had atrium, and if we created, like, a study lounge in the alumni lounge, mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you have, you're talking maybe multiple supervisors, right? Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. okay. Right, we know that if we give kids meaningful work and like okay. the survey that Kevin talked about, right? Like they, they recognize the freedom and the voice and the choice and they respect that. And I think they rise to the occasion, you know, 99% of them are gonna rise to the occasion, right? Like they're gonna do what it is that they need to do yes. to be successful. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So. Um. Yeah, Mr. Dibus, you, you, I think, used the term the modern learner. Yes. And it's very clear to me, based on your presentation and also having heard of the flipped classrooms, I mean, what you're engaging in is modern teaching. Mm -hmm. So I certainly very much appreciate that. I uh, appreciate your courage in trying something new, accepting the commitment to putting the additional time in. So uh, the word culture was used too. Maybe this requires culture. I. I, this is something we're starting to talk about, um, and so thank you for your presentation. I think it's very impressive. We'll talk more, Bridget. <coughs> Sounds great. Figure out some things. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing for the board about Bright Bites. It's free. It is a very expensive tool. West 40 pays for it. The data that you get from it is phenomenal, and and Bridget uses it well to improve teaching and learning. Uh, as far as the technology is concerned. Well, maybe more, Kylie. I'm not giving you an answer tonight. I see you, you staring. Norman, come see me. I see you staring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm deflecting right now. Are you teaching a class on blended? 
or something with Northwestern? I oh, I uh, got hired to teach an online pre calc through Northwestern for high school students just across America that are gifted. So it's a totally online course. Fantastic. Right. Right. Congratulations. Nice Congratulations. job. We overheard that today in a different meeting yeah. we were in. So. Oh, well, and I'm excited that's scary. for how that's going to inform <laughs> some of this, yeah. too, right? Yeah. 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 I think it will I think, definitely help yes. um, mold this even better. Too. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Good job, Thank everybody. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. That's two things. You brought the one to one down the path, and now you're doing this. So Let's keep up the good it, work. Right? Keep it. up the good work. Right. Omar, are you just hanging around today to watch the board meeting, or what's going on? Here? <laughs> so this is the longest I've seen our students stay. I know. Okay. I'm very excited. I think they wanted to talk about blended learning. They wanted to hear about it. Are they in blended learning? Um, I don't think any of them. Are you any of you in blended learning? I don't think so. Are you? No, I'm sorry. Are you? Like, I'm in the community. Oh, it's like we can't hear photography. Like, there's like six people we get past. Yeah. But I like it. It's yeah. nice. I approve. So you're just, you're just hanging out tonight watching a movie? Hanging out. Uh -huh. All right, watching a meeting, not the movie. You're watching the meeting? <laughs> yeah, we have more comments then. But then okay, okay, all right. Okay. All right, text. What Professional development. All right. Okay. Uh -huh. Short version? I feel the way I feel, yes. It's a right. lot of lucky I know you're under the weather. Okay. Um, so what I included for you, I have no idea what the page numbers are, so I'm sorry because Kristen ruined the whole. Page. <laughs> Just kidding. I read it after your report. Page what? Page seven and eight. Page seven and eight. So the professional development summary from um, the first semester, and I have the questions that were submitted, so I'm going to try to weave them in, and then if I miss them. Um, just let me know. Um, professional development is um, the funding that I get. Generally, the bulk of it comes out of the Title I Professional Development Grant. And every year, as soon as I get the okay from the business office that we have received that approval, I put out a professional development application that stays live for the entire year. The funding that we get typically, um, this year it's at for about $45,000, is typically enough to do a rolling professional development request. So I don't expect teachers to know everything that they could possibly want to do in August because those things pop up throughout the year. So I leave that, um, it's just a Google form that I leave live throughout the year that people can um, continually request professional development. And every other week when we have leadership council, I always update the instructional coaches to let them know we still have money, there's still funding there that people can apply for, so we're kind of continuously reminding people there is money to, to apply for. Um, we do prioritize um, our funds, um, whereas I try to reserve money for specifically AP, um, professional development for teachers that are teaching advanced placement courses because that has probably the most rigorous standards in terms of needing to be trained to be able to teach that as well as um, I try to prioritize money for initiatives like blended learning we put some money aside for blended learning or for particular interventions that we are looking to um, implement but typically we um, I know that sometimes it comes out from staff that we need more professional development money and that that's something that I hear sometimes, but I can tell you that right now I'm sitting on about $20,000 from a Title II grant, so I, mean, I think we're in pretty good shape. I have not, to my knowledge, last year nor this year denied any professional development requests, so teachers are able to really enrich themselves professionally as they see fit. The document that you have outlines the different areas of funding, as I mentioned I'm focusing mostly on Title II because that is where the bulk of our money comes. So when you take a look at the um, Title II, some of the some of the professional development experiences that people have gone through, that solid bullet, all of those things are, are experiences that have already happened. And then the open um, circle bullet are experiences that are scheduled for second semester or sometimes in the summer. All of the AP institutes are typically in the summer. 
So we've got around we've got twenty eight thousand dollars left. So I feel really confident that between now and the end of the summer, even with the money that I have earmarked for teachers that need advanced placement training, which can tend to be on the higher end cost wise, um, I feel very confident that we have enough money in there to be able to um, meet the needs of our staff. Um, we have a very small amount marked for um, technology PD, so IdeaCon is the former ICE conference. We allocate that money just out of that title grant as well. That's not the only money that we allocate for, P or, uh, for technology, so if we spent that $500 and somebody wanted to go to something else technology related, I would just be able to pull that from um, that title to grant. Um, one thing that's a little bit different um, this year will be that um, unclaimed tuition reimbursement funds. Normally we get, I want to say it's between like 10 and 12,000 um, that is left over from what the board sets aside to reimburse staff members um, for their tuition when they're pursuing an advanced degree. Um, this year, I believe it's gone, it's already gone. So we've zeroed that account out. We had lots of staff members um, go for an advanced degree and so that money is gone. So we don't have that 10 to 12,000 to rely on in the summer. But like I said, with that 28, that I have left over in Title II, I feel pretty comfortable that we are meeting the needs um, of our staff. <clears throat> I think I answered the questions um, in that one. Textbooks? Short version. Sure. <laughs> so um, the summary of textbooks that you have in front of you outlines our proposals for the textbooks we would like to purchase for next year. Again, I'll try to weave those, con those right, questions. Give us one second, Mary. Page. page. 61. 61. So um, one of the questions that was submitted was um, where we are in the three-year plan with our textbooks. Um, we have kind of hit the point of the three-year plan. Next year we have Spanish 4 in the works as well as health. And then beyond that, so far there have sort of been crickets. Uh, Lindsay Mina and I are talking a little bit about an AP stats um, text, but we're still looking through what will be beyond uh, next year because we've kind of hit our needs over the most part over the last five years that I have um, been here. So what you see in front of you are, represents three courses. Um, there was a question about the English 10, um, and I had, I had remarked in my documentation that we are seeing, since the onset of one-to-one, -one, we are coming to a point where the debate of textbook here and textbook on a screen and what is better. Um, College Board feels pretty strongly that students should be reading text. They should be reading out of a book and they should be reading physical text and not just from a screen. And there are studies that support the amount of screen time and all of that um, being one of the reasons for that. So what you will see sometimes, and, and English is an example, is purchasing class sets of books where students aren't necessarily lugging home the AP approved College Board book because they're probably not going to do that. That was my right. question. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so having those classroom sets in the classroom allow the teachers and the students to interact with the text there and then the technology then is an extension of that learning that they can continue um, when, they go, when they go home. So we're always looking at how can we get um, our biggest bang for our buck in terms of the learning experience for the kids. So in this situation, you would have text in class and then be able to extend at home. Um, the Spanish 3, for example, we get a flex text with that. So we get licenses, but we also have a classroom set that stays in the classroom. And that's really been the model that has been working so far since I've been here over the past five years. The science has typically been completely online. The Discovery Ed tech book in science is completely online. For physics and AP physics, we're going a little bit of a different route for that. Um, again, because the what we're seeing is we're wanting to be in line with that AP honors track, and we're seeing for those advanced level courses, we are seeing um, the need to have an actual book in front of us. What's happening when students are 
interfacing with just the textbook on their computer, they're not used to that. And so there is a bit of a learning curve that happens when the text is completely and solely on the computer. And there's something that sometimes get lost, gets lost in that translation um, for students. So we feel pretty strongly that having a blended model to be able to access text sometimes and be able to access the electronic resources um, is really best. There's a trick to this whole thing, too, with one-to-one -one and online textbooks. And one of the questions that was submitted um, noted that you're seeing maybe more of an increase in textbooks than you may have expected to see now that we're all one-to-one. -one. Um, interestingly enough, it is much more expensive to have textbooks online than it is to have textbooks in your hand. And the licensing is really the issue there. So there was a question about what is kind of the standard licensing. It tends to be about five or six years. It really depends solely on the company. Um, what happens when you buy a flex text, for example, in Spanish 3, um, we buy a six-year license. Throughout that six years, every time the company makes updates to their resources, they add a new video, they add new work, we get that all. So it's, it's wonderful. But what happens is you're buying licenses much more frequently than you would have bought textbooks good or bad, call it one, call it the other, six in one hand, half dozen in the other, you're getting the most updated resources when you have to upgrade that, that frequently, but you're also spending a lot of money. And so you're seeing costs increase because wherein, and while I know it maybe isn't popular when a book was used for maybe 10 or 12 years, that was a very considerable cost savings. With licenses, you're having to re-up every five years or so. And what we're noticing, for example, if you look at Spanish 3, $125.84, that's more than some hardcover textbooks. So, you know, when I'm looking at, Bill Fry sent me the, the health quote for next year, and it was about $95. So you're not going to see a savings when you're buying licenses on the computer. You're just getting kind of a different, a different thing um, with them. But with all of these textbooks, and, and since I've been here, we've always made sure that we have um, electronic ancillary resources. We we have additional electronic content that students can access because we are valuing the one-to-one -one initiative. But what we're finding is that sometimes you cannot just assume that we're going to be able to replace the textbooks and that that's going to come um, as some sort of savings. One thing that was um, a particular question was about last year. Last year was a really big bubble in terms of that $155,000 spend, and that was because that was the renewal of our Carnegie Math license. And that is a five-year license, and it's huge. It comes with um, a, a platform through which students can have computer-adapted practice in Mathia, um, and it is all of the learning text and everything that goes into our math <laughs> curriculum. Um, so that's why you're going to see that big bubble in last year. And that's something that's going to pop up with math. As long as we use Carnegie, that's something that's going to pop up with math every five years. Um, so while it's not necessarily ideal that the, the cost doesn't come down with regard to using the technology and the licenses, we can at least know that we are getting our students the most up-to-date resources. Uh, we were talking in Leadership Council recently, and we were talking about the government books that Erin Cunningham got last year, and she was like, they're out of date already. We had an impeachment. So, you know, it's, <laughs> these things happen. And uh, the, the nice thing is that the electronic licenses kind of go with that flow and update automatically. But the back end of that is you have to pay for them more frequently than you would a textbook. I would also add with Carnegie, um, part of that package is um, it's for freshmen, sophomores, juniors, algebra, geo, and algebra two, but they get consumable workbooks. And so over five years, we recover the cost for those workbooks, which I believe off the top of my head is like $15 a student. We recover that cost in student fees to offset uh, that large ticket price that we pay up front. Okay. Is it a record? Did you time it? Yeah, you it. I don't think it was a record. It's because I don't want to keep track of time. I'm just happy to be here. So happy to be here. Any other questions, questions for Kylie? No. 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 Get her out of here. Get her out of here. Thanks, Omar. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you. Wow. Thank, Thank you, Kylie. Thanks. Feel better. I'm not saying for you. He's saying to you. Wow. What a good partner, huh?
that day. And the last From one assistant remember, principal to another. Even I say for you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Shade, Omar. <laughs> Dave, let's cover your student handbook. We'll get you on the road. I know you have a long ride, and then Chris and can come back and do the assistance. So. Appreciate it. Good evening, board. Uh, tonight, this is the first read of major changes to the 2021 handbook in preparation for this annual review. Um, this year, we took a little bit of a different stance on it. We got quite a bit of data from our staff. We sent the Google survey out with targeted questions pertaining to excessive absences, to getting their feelings on the dress code. Um, to exemptions and things like that. And so uh, the data came back um, unconclusive, to be honest with you, in some areas. One area that came back, which we'll touch on, is absences and sicknesses and call-ins from parents. So I'm gonna touch on that briefly here. Uh, the sheet that I gave in the board packet will go over briefly. Um, the first one for major changes would be to add some language to our to our uh, senior exa final exam exemptions. Last year we added tardies uh, and cuts um, as um, exclusionary qualifiers for, for students if they get a cut or they get a suspension or if excessive tardies, then they would be excluded from their final exam exemption. This year, just looking at things and the way our behavior is within um, our office, we also want to include code of conduct violations as well. So that would be a code of conduct violation. Anything unbecoming, if you look at the code of conduct language, um, kind of unbecoming of an athlete or a uh, student in extracurricular activities, something like that um, would stem to a code of conduct violation. So we want to add that in. If a student receives a code of conduct violation, um, senior exam exemptions are a privilege, you know, and we want to keep it as such. And so we want exemplary status behavior from our students. So we add, want to add that language in. Um, graduation requirements and meeting with our parents. Um, the fine arts survey, the language in the handbook, they kind of go over units of performing arts and visual arts and what are those. And so our parents really wanted us to define what classes fall under those areas. And so I just, I'm just going to bold in, like here it's in a curriculum guide at page 70 so that they have a reference to go to for some of that stuff. And that's to get out of the fine arts survey requirement. And or, yeah, like what classes you can take for that, correct? Okay. Excessive absences, this is language that it's kind of unclear in the handbook as it currently stands. Under excessive absences, it states currently that any student who is absent for 5% in one semester, which is roughly 4.5 days or so, um, is excused or unexcused will be considered as having excessive absences. That's under our excessive absence category. If you go back to page previously, which is unexcused absences, it says, in order to comply with school code, the scores are the right to determine if an absence is excused or unexcused, and if a student exceeds five absences, not 5%. And so when I was looking at language, I just took language from, I looked at Downers Grove, and they have a number instead of a percentage. And so looking at our excessive absences, although the state code says 5%, I think giving parents a number, I put six in there because I think that one more, but I think taking a better look at this and after talking with Gina a little bit, we go five as our number, you know, and that would give the parents a, a definite area target then instead of the 5%. Because 5% for me could be 5% of the year, 5% of the semester if I'm a parent. Um, I think hard numbers work better there. So I'm just looking to add, instead of the six, we'll go with five under the excessive absences, just to match it up with the language in the previous page. What if they're excused, sense. though? Or is it five across the board? That's what I thought I heard you saying, whether they're excused or not. So the way it reads is 5% uh, in one semester are considered excessive. Mm -hmm. So I just want to put five absences, not 5% <clears throat> is considered excessive. Then it's up to the school to determine if that's excused or unexcused. Typically, if there's a doctor's note, family emergency, okay. stuff like that, those will automatically be excused. Okay, so they don't count. Against. Then we're going to qualify. Already in here, there's bulleted, you know, areas like oversleeping, um, missing. You know, we're on bus service here, but uh, like babysitting, shopping, you worked too late. Those are not ex valid excuses. Right. So if you're above the five with that, then those would be unexcused. And it gives our teachers like definites for, okay, they're not gonna be able to receive credit for the work because they overslept and since there's six absence. And that's what our teachers are really looking for too. Um, but if they have valid you know, uh, college visit, 
family emergency, what have you, obviously will make that excused and they can get credit for their work there. So that's the change there for the language <coughs> in the excessive absence category. Uh, this year we worked hard to get out our see something, say something campaign. We included a QR code on a lot of the posters around the building. We want to put that in the front of our handbook, like the first page we want to put a QR code so that students can go to that very quickly to pull up our concerning report and bullying report as well. So that's a new ad we want to include. Um, the Ashley's law was a mandate by the state this year to, to have language regarding the medical marijuana distribution in schools. Uh, there's a policy and a board for that already. I don't want to like get crazy with the language in the handbook. And so I don't want to put a big narrative in there. I think at the end of the day, we're going to refer to this as a board policy, refer to the board policy on that. So I included language in here, but I think in hindsight, we're just going to put the board policy, see board policy on that. That's what we've done with, with other language. And the last thing with the dress code, thank you for the board question. I wholeheartedly agree. Let's be positive with the language up front. And so we'll change that um, a little bit. And so the language that we would have is um, only religious head coverings, um, only non-religious head covering may not be worn in the building at any time. So we're not, we're being more proactive saying, you know, not the other way that I had it. Religious head coverings may be the only thing worn. I don't know if I'm articulating that correctly right now. But it's uh, you look at it one last time. Yeah, we'll look at it. So what we're trying to do, obviously, <laughs> if there's religious and exceptions. The, and the English teacher look at it one last time. Uh, we're going to make exceptions for any, any head coverings due to religious uh, reasons. Dave, this test, this assessment schedule, is that in there? So yeah, I gave you the testing schedule and I highlighted it in yellow. This year the mandate was for juniors to be tested and not freshmen. Uh, we're doing that in March, so that's coming up here. I just wanted to point that out to you that that's a change. And so we'll include this schedule because it's going to be different for our parents as well so that they're aware of that, that our juniors are going to be tested in the science assessment, and that's three times. So it's quite a bit of time out uh, to be assessed, but that's a state requirement there for that assessment. We need to review this probably a little more with Kylie and Hector because I know we're pulling together the evaluation team, and so I'm not sure if <laughs> Where, we're, where our status will be with the academic vocabulary. Um, just if we're gonna change some of our data points for our, our evaluation tool. But gotcha. I, that meeting is not till the springtime, I think. So um, that's just flag this that we should touch base before the March 10th, uh, before the March 10th meeting, I'm sorry. So nothing <laughs> really major, uh, just minor tweaks and a couple additions, but that's where we're at with the handbook. Thank you. Thank you. I like it. I know they're scaring me what they're waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen. All right. Uh, my board reports begin on page 13 of board book, and tonight the reports presented represent financial information for the month of January, which is 58% of our operating budget for the year. Um, on board book page 13, we have the monthly summary report. And you can see the total revenue for the month was $720,268, with 37% coming from evidence-based funding, which is our state funding, um, and 35% coming from state and federal reimbursement. Primarily, the majority of that was special education. Um, the total expenditures for the month were almost $2 million, uh, with 78% towards salary and benefits and 7% towards special education tuition. Um, on board book page 14 begins the monthly financial statements. Um, the year to date in the operating fund, the district has received almost $13 million and expended a little over $16 million. So right now uh, our snapshot is that we're deficit spending um, a little over $3 million. Um, I highlight this because we certainly won't finish the year at this point in time, but it's important to note that this is why it's important to have a fund balance um, so that until we receive the second installment of property taxes, you know, we're significantly deficit spending. Um, so again, um, we certainly will not finish the year with a $3 million deficit, but um, you know, I just wanted to highlight where we're at right now at this point in the year. 
Um, the next page, board book page 15, summary of revenues for the district shows that the district has received 49% of our revenue in the operating funds for this year, and that amount is very equivalent to where we were at this point last year, we were at 48%. Um, the next page is the summary of expenditures, uh, which shows the district has spent 60% of the budgeted expenditures for the year in the operating accounts. And this is also, again, really similar to at this point last year where we are at 59%. Um, when you begin to look at all the other funds, it's a little misleading because uh, it often depends on whatever uh, life safety projects we have uh, going on. Um, for the board's information, I also uh, shared, as I do every month, the statement of revenues and expenditures for the month of January. Uh, so at your leisure, this includes all of our accounts and the uh, year-to-date expenditures in each account, and you can see kind of where we are on track uh, for the budget. Um, we also use this, uh, since it's our first year of accounting software, to, if we miskeyed anything, we use this to correct something. Um, so we look at this uh, very, very frequently in the business office. Also, again, just for your information, I provided the student activity account summary, which begins on board book page 26. Again, this is the report for uh, the month of January. The only thing really of note that I've mentioned for the past couple of months is our AP testing account will continue to carry a large balance until we pay off that college board um, bill in, I believe it's May or June, um, probably more June. Um, and so we're, those are where our, all the student fees go and we collect $95 um, for each test per student. So that's why that account balance is so big. Um, and then lastly, in the report, the budget calendar begins on board book page 32. Um, so this is a summary of how I'll approach uh, coming up with the budget for fiscal year 21. Uh, the goal is to have a tentative budget approved by the board at the June 2020 meeting. 2020 meeting. So this kind of outlines backwards how we're going to get there so that we ultimately get the final budget approved in September. Uh, there were two qu uh, questions submitted. Uh, the first question was in regards to position control. So position control is just a giant Excel spreadsheet uh, that we maintain every year with every position in the district listed, as well as who's filling that position and what their salary is. Um, and then we use that to make sure we've accounted for all of the positions, and then that feeds into the budget. Oh, okay. um, so that's what I was So I've seen it to. before, I just didn't know what it's called. I yeah. was like, I don't know what this is. Um, we don't share that with the board. I mean, that's just oh, that's internal? internal oh, okay. Right. Oh, so I haven't uh -huh. seen it. No, you have. Okay. Um, and then the other question submitted was uh, in regards to staffing. So staffing is presented to the board in March, and that is when we will ask the board to approve any classes that are under 20, um, and that usually is the information that we need then to go back as an administrative team and finalize staffing. Um, so typically the board only sees the staffing uh, once unless we need to come back to the board to ask for some additional FTE. Um, and so that's why we try to get both of those things accomplished in March um, before we go on spring break because over spring break is when we start to build the master schedule and identify which classes are going to be taught which periods. So one of the ones under March is board and one's admin? Correct. All right, so we should just clear, we clarify that for the future. That concludes my report. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Go to visitor statements. Would so someone like to make a statement? Oh, okay. well, I gotta, I'm gonna read. Hold on, I gotta read my little thing. The Board of Education welcomes. Hold on, let him read his, let him read his introductory statement. The Board of Education welcomes and encourages the participation of the citizens in the business of school district. There are two points in the meeting where visitor statements are scheduled. Citizens are welcome to raise questions or make comments in either one. Comments will be limited to three minutes per individual. It cannot be combined. Please note the Board of Education will not answer questions or engage in dialogue during visitor comments. If a person would like additional time to address the Board, such a request should be submitted in writing 48 hours before the meeting to the superintendent. Go ahead. Okay, so this is a little different than what I do, but I was supposed to do like an introduction again. So I'm Taylor Jurgens, President's SA. Mm -hmm. I'm Paul Sinisbelli. I'm Molly Durkin. Omar, students with you. <laughs> um, and so we just wanted to come and quickly talk about like climate change because we feel like 
um, we should bring up here. I feel like it's a bit more of an appropriate setting. Um, I, I, you guys are probably aware we had, um, there was a walkout in September last um, semester, and I feel like we didn't really talk about it because maybe we weren't really educated or prepared about it. But I feel like we should start talking about it and become educated and informed because I feel like our the young, like this generation like the young generation is should like is like the generation that should help and I feel like if we're educated we can do stuff in our futures to help out and educate further. Um, I also I feel like um, in our past like our grade and other classes around us they've been really passionate and been able to speak their mind and I feel like just because we. We started to form that connection with our our board, and after like the meeting on Saturday, I felt like I do have like a say in like on my community. I want to help out further because I know we do a lot with like pop tops and cone blank drives and stuff like that. But I feel like climate change is like a, obviously it's a worldwide issue, and um, I know like RV students. We talked a lot about and we started like a women empowerment club, and like we've done a lot with like LGBTQIA um, TQIA and like other minority groups. And I feel like climate change should be among those issues that we talk about, as it's not just one group that's affected. And I mean, for those who don't know, like it's, I mean, it's increasing greatly as like the carbon dioxide are increasing, um, are like high the, at the highest levels in like 650,000 years. And then there's like the sea levels are rising, and it's like it's like 3.3 millimeters per year. And then like glaciers are melting, and there's it's like about 500 kilotons per year. Like it's crazy stuff that is happening. And I don't feel like we really talk about it in a curriculum that much. Um, the only time that's really have been brought up has been um, in zoology, and we don't really talk about it. But we do reports on like animals, especially recently we've been doing like marine life, and that's something I'm really passionate about. Like marine, like I really want to work with that. But it's it's like heartbreaking to see like every threat is climate change problem because species are becoming endangered and extinct, and like everything's like deteriorating and everything and stuff like that. So I feel like. Um, if our school can come together in our community and just start working on like just at least spreading awareness and getting the conversation like starting conversation so then like our future would like, be really helpful like we can start garden like try to do stuff and I know like bring ecology club into it or start our own club like in all, in all for climate change or we can do like so grow your own garden encourage like carpooling biking walking using the bus um, and then there's like a it's like a waste reduction week that you have usually happens like the end of April or October that a lot of schools do and we can try to do that which would be like good and like just for people to like recycling and like no difference between recycling and waste and try to like reduce that with, like, especially with like our plastic try to do like water dispensers and reusable stuff and try to like reuse uh, all our supplies and stuff like that we were so. talking about how. I'm not sure, but at like our elementary schools and middle schools, we had um, like motion sensor lights. So when people were in the classrooms, the lights would be on, but when people left, the lights would be turned off. And that would save a lot of energy because the lights are on in the bathrooms all day, but people aren't necessarily in the bathrooms all day, as well as the faucets in the bathroom. I find that a lot of them are leaky. so that. I mean, that could be a big cost as to the environment and to the school as well. I thought we had motion sensors in our classrooms, right? <coughs> we did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's just, it's it's just that people are probably going in and out mileage so much during the day. That one might be. I think we put them in the gyms, the bathrooms. Classrooms. And classrooms. That, um, I just feel like the younger generation are extremely passionate, being one of them, about climate change. And we just need to prepare ourselves. Maybe, maybe just at least inform ourselves, be well educated upon the subject, because these younger generations are gonna start taking action. Whatever that action may be, we need to be assess the damages and figure out what we're gonna do about it, how it's gonna be controlled in a safe environment. And I feel like around the school there are definitely just pressing maybe some initiatives that we could take to like, you know, maybe like a green initiative, something we could do. Um, I know like sometimes like we've had in the past like the lights of some of the lights in the school like aren't all on, and I feel like that's, that's I think that's perfectly fine because I think in the hallways we can all see regardless. So maybe we just like half lights for like you know one day out of the week, three days out of the week, all the time. You know, I feel like there's stuff around the building that maybe if we like were to ask like these kids like what do you see around the building that could affect you know and try to figure out like what we can do because I feel like maybe we're not noticing it but there's a lot of things that we can do. Yeah, so I just think our like, overall purpose is like. 
coming out here today or tonight is just just to get like the word and start talking about it and trying to spread awareness and I feel like this is like the best place to talk about it to like figure out how we can um, find different ways and start to the school talking in the community too and like everyone together and like finding more um, earth friendly ways to do some things in order to improve. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I Thank encourage you. you guys to, do you know what design thinking is? No. Okay, so uh, note that design thinking <coughs> is a process through Stanford University where you identify a problem and then you work through to find a, a, a you can engineer or come up with solutions and you reiterate them to get something that you think works but it's a good framework for you to to look at and follow if you want to make change around you it just kind of gives you something to to sort of where am I at in the process and figure that out um, I applaud your um, you know your citizenship this so it's not really a word but um, you know and bringing this to our attention I think you are absolutely right I think there are um, some other factors that you could look at. Citizen comments. I know. Sorry. <laughs> well, they're, they're good there's kids. No dialogue. Who... There's no dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> there is now. There's like a student body. You have two board members I think would be willing to work with you on a committee. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let us know I, I what wonder, you need. Mr. Well, Jake, I'm, I'm very I'm proud of my daughter to come up here and speak. Oh. And... <laughs> Yes, good job. It's not easy and for Sometimes all four of you actually to come up and speak your, your, your mind on your belief and your opinion, which we respect and we understand. And uh, I think we need to open up our uh, thinking, uh, thinking yeah. you know, our, our generation. So. Thank you. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you for staying so late. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mike. Well, have a good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, discussion information items. At this point, the board in the meeting, Board of Education members may request to add an additional discussion item. All right. No, no. Strategic planning workshop follow up. You know, uh, I sent out a uh, thank you note to all the participants. I thought we had a great turnout, uh, we had representation. From, from every group, uh, with, with the exception of uh, the two chambers and uh, the village of Brookfield. Um, everybody else sent a representative. I thought, I thought the, the facilitator from IASB did a nice job keeping everybody on point, but really allowing the groups to uh, make, you know, make their, you know, let the collaboration really drive the event. Uh, I sent out a summary report um, to all the participants so they could see what the board kind of worked on after and see all the different thoughts did that, that go, came up. Did that also go to those who had RSVP but that didn't show up? Uh, I did send it, I think I did keep those on the email. Okay. I um, think it would be helpful yes. if people had illness or something. Correct. Chances. I think from the from the groups they only had one representative. Okay. So like uh, the RBEF, I sent one to Joanne, I believe, and uh, to some of those other ones. Okay. Thank you. Um, but, you know, be interested to hear what the board's thoughts were. So I'll, I'll jump in. I thought it was a very productive session. It was a long day, but I think it was, um, the facilitator was very good. I think the student participation was excellent. I think um, one of the things we, we did talk about is that there were perhaps not brand new ideas, but it was a new prioritization of ideas that had been discussed. And that's, I think, an important part of any strategic planning process. Um, I mean, I think our, our work is cut out for us and, and the administration's work in terms of, you know, reviewing the mission statement, um, actually developing goals, because there had been some goal categories, but perhaps not specific goals, and then finding the metrics that actually support those goals. I think that that's where the, the, the rubber hits the road. So there's definitely not a, it's not getting resolved tonight, but I think it was, it was a really good start and I am glad that everyone agreed and we were able to move it forward. Yeah, I'd just like to second that because I've, um, over the years I've been involved in numerous exercises like this, whether in, in settings like this or even in a company, but it was, um, I thought it was exceptionally well facilitated, 
uh, time was used smartly and because the there was a, a truly broad representation of the members of the community I just was really encouraged that you know it wasn't a lot of talking in circles I mean people could really make a point or write things down and then there was some debate um, it was very solid so I was, I was impressed with it too I just have to apologize for my absence I had to work I was hosting 106 eager third through twelfth graders so sorry yeah I echo what they said I and I really hats off to the facilitator for her to be able to have reined that many people in keep us on topic and get through the entire agenda in really what was I think a short amount of time was really impressive yeah, it's great to see yeah. the uh, participation especially among the students you know their commitment oh, to yes. you know the how things are right now but also for the future and uh, Can't be more impressed you know, than everybody's commitment on Saturday. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the facilitator was very good, and yeah, yeah it, was, it was a great you know event to kickstart what we wanted to do. It was. Yeah, I'd love echo that and thank everybody for coming. I really appreciate it, mm -hmm. and it's you know this is what. What we're here to do, and it was nice to see in common goal. You know, everybody we started in the right place. You know, it's all about the students, so it was good. So next steps on that, I think, just so that we're generally clear, um, Kevin, you sent out the the summary notes, and then probably in a meeting or two or three meetings, we'll rediscuss right. things like mission and goals. I'm I assuming. think we leave this on as a discussion, mm -hmm. and then what I'll do is. Uh, I think like you know maybe the next thing we'll bring is a couple drafts of the mission mm -hmm. let the board discuss it see if they want to make any changes finalize that then we'll bring some of the goals I'll bring some drafts of the language on the goals and we'll do that for a meeting or two and then we'll go into indicator mm -hmm. and maybe put them out there on the website for comment and sure you know or back to the group whatever makes sense right. um, so I think it is an iterative process it's not it's not quick right. I, I, I would imagine it'll take most of the spring okay yeah, and I do like before we approve the goals that we do post them for comment mm -hmm. because we want to make sure that we're capturing the sentiment of the community. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Absolutely. Probably best would be to send it back through that group email so at least the people who gave values, gave expectations, will have an idea of what we're working on the, the drafts. Um, we'll then be posted on our website with the reports and stuff. Yeah, I mean, we want to have people who didn't come to that meeting be able to react to them. I agree, right? So we can. That's what I mean by through. posting it on the website, as opposed to. I don't. I'm not sure what you were talking about, Kevin. Sending it back through the group. That well, I, I, I want to make sure, like before we even, as we work through drafts, oh, okay. we send it to that group of 30, 35 yeah. that were oh, okay. there, so they, because they were the ones that helped got us to that point, right? right? So we want to make sure that, and then once we think we have something out there, then we can post it for yep. a week or two and mm -hmm. see if we get any other additional feedback from the wider on the yes. larger on. No, that makes sense, I think. Okay, got it. All right, old business, life safety. Kristen will address the uh, bid for the gymnastics rooftop unit under new business. No other updates at this time. Natural gas. Kristen, natural gas contract. This is our second read. This is our second read. Our legal counsel has approved the language in the direct <coughs> energy contract, which I uploaded to the board book today. Uh, the current price is uh, has gone up uh, since the first read, um, and so you can see the cost is uh, about 26 uh, cents per therm. Um, and so this reflects a potential savings of a little over $1,000 in the first year, and it's a three-year contract, so. Um, if rates were the same compared to these last three years versus these three years, it'd be $1,000 each year. I'm seeking approval for, uh, for tonight. There was a question submitted on this. What was the savings or what, what did we lose by waiting another two weeks? Um, we lost a little over $1,000 a year. Okay. 
All right, is there any questions? Let's discuss that. Okay, you want me to read the motion? Okay. Well, Court. did, uh, I'm sorry. No, did, no, no, no. Deanne, I have one question about this at the last meeting on the um, heating. She, she had asked why there was only the one on the consortium or? And we addressed that last week that uh, that's okay. just how they got their, what they get their quotes through. And that's why we're going with a different group to get three quotes. Correct. Okay. 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 The Board of Education Township High School District 208, Cook County, Illinois, approves the resolution approving direct energy as the natural, natural gas supplier pending legal counsel review as presented in the February 25th, 2020 board agenda packet. A second. 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 Gina Sierra seconded. Marianne, this will require a roll call vote. Roll call. Uh, Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Ms. Ruska? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Ms. Sierra? Yes. Ms. Towner? Yes. Ms. Mr. Smith? Yes. All right, educational tour request cheerleading. This is the second read. Uh, somebody, uh, Ms. Ruska submitted questions uh, this afternoon. Uh, so I tried to send those out. Uh, Dr. Freitas, do you have resp uh, responses on those? I do have responses. Uh, for the first question, uh, we have no male participants. Okay. However, since the head coach is a male and it's an overnight trip, it was decided to bring a female coach okay. along. And that's kind of been practice, at least how I was informed about our trips. Um, also, in May, the coach will share a permission form that is standard here. Um, I'll make sure I share with the board. It wasn't included in the packet, but it goes over all the responsibilities, expectations. That's a standard form that we use. I'll make sure you guys get it. And yeah, because that wasn't in the packet. It wasn't correct. It should, and, it should have been attached. And so what I would like to share with the board, uh, several years ago, we did have an incident with one of the students uh, left in the middle of the evening and had did something. And that student was sent home. And so, uh, you know, there needs to be some kind of form. We would need to, you know, checklist that the parents know that there are strict behavior requirements. And if you violate any of those at the cost to the family, your student is coming home immediately. Well, so I, I want to make sure I understand the question, though. The, that, that form was still going to the students. It just wasn't in the board packet. Well, right. it, wasn't it wasn't checked or it wasn't included in that. So. What I did in the two weeks, I was looking through some of our other packets, and I didn't see it in this packet. Okay. You know how there's the checklist? Mm -hmm. So I didn't see that form, and then the uh, then there was one more. Because that's for our own liability, that if somebody were to just kind of wander off, mm -hmm. it, you know, we need to have a recourse for the discipline. But, but it had gone to the students. Is that correct? The, student, the students will get the permission. We can't go on the trip unless they turn in the permission. So we don't send that out to the students until the, the board. field trip approves it. Okay, approved okay. by the board and they do the fundraising. I just want to, I want to understand what the gap actually was. Yeah. So that's helpful. Well, Thank we you. didn't know that they had it because it wasn't included in the checklist here. That and there was a form of such. in the board packet. Okay. And with the beginning part filled out. Um, so Hector did something just to make sure we do in the future. Yes, boss. Third question, you asked about liability. Yes. Uh, anytime the board approves it, we're basically saying they're going on behalf of the school. So there is liability for the school district. This so, is not one of those trips where we have a different form that we use, like when a group says um, we're going to the Galapagos Island in the summer or we're doing it, the China trip and it's more through a tour agency and it might just be include some of our students and teacher we make them sign a waiver saying that this is not a school sponsored trip and there is no liability to the school this is our actual cheerleading team moving so this would they're representing rb and there is some liability to rb and that's covered under our student insurance so then you know because we just came out of a very long lawsuit if something very unfortunate were to happen to one of the students um, at the event, are we identified and indemnified? I don't think you could ever say we're indemnified that, because that, we're sending our team. I mean, we, we signed a permission slip so the parents will waive some of that, but that doesn't stop somebody from filing suit. Yeah, I, I think the waivers are just a false sense of security for right. Illinois. They're more, I look at them as a uh, speed bump 
as opposed to like a total uh, dead end where nothing can happen. Um, I, I think generally they don't hold up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, very important to have, but it's not the end all and be all. Is that what you're saying? It's the it's the, the language is included in the permission sure. so if the parent understands like they're waving or they're given permission to go and indemnify, but. I mean, they are, it's, it's, it's the Riverside Brookfield High School cheerleading team going to a camp. So, I mean, there is going to always be some liability. That's why we have it's, the it's board, board approve it. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, make sure we had crossed that bridge because we missed that one clause, which then threw us into the lawsuit with the basketball player. You know, and, for and, our and life. That was a different, it wasn't a different, that was a, a different, that was a rental. Mm -hmm. That was a rental. Was and a so I just clause. wanted to make sure that here we had crossed all our T's on our insurance policies that okay. we didn't miss anything. You know, what is our obligation for when students are representing the school and they are out right. and they are um, an athletic event which has risk? And uh, you know, have been better prepared. Made. And so that's been covered by our attorneys that we, you know, we. These are all. Yeah, these are all forms created by forensic. Okay. We also do have a, a student accident insurance. So if a student does get hurt after they submit to their primary insurance, that's the secondary insurance uh, that all students have the ability to utilize should they get injured in a school-sponsored activity. Do they have to fill that out prior to going, or no. just fill it out when they get hurt? Oh, when they get hurt. Okay. Okay. The Board of Education, Township High School, District 208, Cook County, Illinois, approves the educational tour request for cheerleading to go to the Super CDA Cheer Camp at Grand Bear Lodge, Utica, Illinois, July 21st through July 24th, 2020, as presented in the February 25th, 2020 Board Agenda Packet. Second. All right, I think there's a roll call. Ms. Resta? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Towner? Yes. Ms. Silas? Yes. Mr. Durkin? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Student handbooks, first reads. We already covered that. Textbook adoption, first read. Cover that. Kristen, gymnastics. Uh, so today the district held a bid opening for the gymnastics rooftop unit. Um, the district went out to bid on February 11th, and we had an optional pre-bid meeting on February 18th. Um, all of the companies that submitted bids uh, today also attended the optional pre-bid meeting, so that was a really good sign. Um, just as background knowledge, this project is scheduled to uh, start on June 17th and be completed on July 22nd. So um, this is a first read. We wanted to present, it's on board book, I believe, page 65, um, but we wanted to present uh, the three, well, all of the bids. Um, but particularly DLA will contact references for the three lowest bids and then they'll make a recommendation just like we did for the roof project and then we'll bring that recommendation to you on March 10th and we will be seeking approval <coughs> on March 10th to award that bid. Um, you can see uh, the three lowest bids range from $61,000 down to $54,625. Um, and uh, as soon as this bid is awarded on March 10th, we'll be scheduling a pre-construction meeting because we'll be coordinating this project along with the roof project uh, that's happening this summer. I have a quick question. In the case like this, I mean, this is relatively straightforward, but who, who does the sort of technical check on the bids, whether they are, how closely they align with the, the documents that I'm sure the architect developed with his engineer I mean is there um, DLA does that in addition to contacting references they go through the bid um, that they that was submitted so that was already done no that will we just got the bids today oh that's right so you that opened them today the so that's the next bidders. step yes, yes. And we did yeah. commissioning on the drawings and, and the stuff before yep. they went out to bid great yeah. that's good the commissioner will the commission will be throughout yes okay uh, this is the first read on educational tour request girls cross country. So this would be a perfect example. First read, the board wants to carry it over to uh, the next meeting. We'll put this on the consent agenda. Is there any questions, discussion on this? Uh, none were submitted. 
we have the same document documents that because I didn't see them included in here and they weren't in the checklist on the front page of this like the parent responsibility checklist Make sure you add that for the next meeting, okay? Yes. That's it. All right. That's the That's it. Task one. That's it. Matters for close. Personal student discipline, purchase sale, probable or imminent pending litigation, collective negotiation, school safety. It's another point for visitor statements. Done. Discussion items. Any requested? No. Nope. Consideration items for future meetings. Resolution. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I su submitted that one page overview statement that was meant to just give a little more background information on uh, positive psychology, Sean Acor in particular, and I didn't mean to, I'm not suggesting any action, I just thought, you know, this sort of goes parallel with our strategic thinking. Okay. So keep that in mind as we do that, as PD or support or future. Yep. Okay. Motion for close, then. Uh, the Board of Education Township High School District 208, Cook County, Illinois, enters closed session for the purpose of considering appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or legal counsel for the public body, student discipline, purchase, sale, or lease of real property, probable, imminent, or pending litigation, collective negotiations, and school safety. Second. Mrs. Sayla's second. All right, roll call. Yes. 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 Yes.